Hi, I'm Jim Waring, Councilman for Phoenix's District 2, and welcome to On the Issues. Today joining me is Police Chief Joe Yonner and Sergeant Darren Wonderly. Thank you both for joining us, we appreciate it. We've never had two uh, people on the show at once, so we're gonna try to make sure we get through everything as quickly as possible, but I thought, uh, I thought this might be an interesting topic. We're gonna be talking about officer-involved shootings and then also transitioning to sort of a related item is the body cameras. They've been much discussed in the news here recently. Part of the reason I wanted to do this is there was, for those who are familiar, who are watching at home, the Coffee with the Cop program. You know, I, I always enjoy going to those. I think citizens got a lot out of it. Uh, it's free, open to the public. Uh, if anybody's interested, please contact my office at 602. 262-7445 and we can give you, you know, basically the, the whens and wheres of when these meetings take place. But I attended one uh, last month or so with some of the officers discussing uh, how policing has changed and uh, the increases in officer involved shootings. I think the record occurred, Chief or Darren, correctly if I'm wrong, in 2013, is that correct? And so there's been, it's, but it's sort of uneven, it's sort of up and down. I was just hoping you guys could, uh, could talk us through a little bit about what's being done about that, why the increase, uh, to the extent that you know, and then just a little bit about uh, what the public can expect going forward. Well, certainly, and, and I'll start, and then Sergeant Wonderly can kind of give some of the stats. First of all, thanks for recognizing Coffee with a Cop, and we encourage people to go to those because that is a great community event where we can exchange information about what's going on in the neighborhoods so that we can better serve those neighborhoods. And I've seen so, you at a lot of them, and too, I which do. I really appreciate that. I go to a lot of them. Because the chief, that, that impresses upon the public how important this They're is. They're great, so we continue to push that program. As far as our officer-involved shootings, back in 2013, we had 31. And that's the highest we've had in the last 15 years. So in 2013, we had 31. 2014, we had 21. Last calendar year, we had 17. Um, so far this calendar year to date, last year at this time we had eight, this year we have five. So we're trending downward in our officer-involved shootings. And how this all come, came about, and Sergeant Wonderly authored this report and did a great job, and it's online if the public wants to go look at it. Um, but we wanted to know on that year in 2013, why did we have so many officer-involved shootings? Because they're traumatic, and we don't want our officers to get involved in shootings. It's, a, it's an officer safety issue, it's a community safety issue. Anytime we're involved in using deadly force, that's a big deal to the community. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing everything right. So um, we sent some officers from our Professional Standards Bureau up to Las Vegas. Uh, DOJ was doing a best practice with Las Vegas Metro Police Department um, on officer-involved shootings, the investigations of officer-involved shootings, trends involved in officer-involved shootings, and we wanted to get a little best practice. And then we came back and compared ourselves to them. And uh, we found out a lot of things. Um, and Darren will go through some of them. But there was a lot of things that were doing very well. And then at the end of the report, there's 15 recommendations on thing that, things that we can do better. Um, and we looked at, again, we looked at our policy, but we looked at the incident, we looked at the officer involved, and we looked at the subject involved. And there's very interesting information that we learned from that. And that's kind of why we started it, because we want to do a better job. And uh, I'm happy to say that our officer involved shootings are trending downward. Um, and that's probably contributed to a lot of things. First of all, training, awareness, um, and we are hitting training very hard in the Phoenix Police Department for the last year and a half, and we're gonna continue to hit training. Uh, it's key to our success. And again, so, as I will say uh, this, not to interrupt, but, but you know, I looked at the chart, and it's 31 one year, and it's 21 the next. It's not, it's not a consistent trend. Is that a fair assessment, Sergeant? Uh, yes, it is, and, and since uh, 2013, that's when this project began. It was the very end of 2013, and, and when we started this project, we knew that we needed to gain that perspective very quickly on officer-involved shootings for several different reasons, as the chief mentioned. Um, first and foremost, the record, right, in 2013. Secondly, we recognize as a department that officer-involved shootings significantly impact uh, officers, their families, the subjects, their families, the community relations, um, and so, so that's why we wanted to do that. And the third reason why is we wanted to identify the factors behind this increase. And so we wanted to do a kind of a progressive and proactive uh, project to try to determine that and figure out what we could do to decrease those shootings moving forward. So it sounds like you're trying to model on what other cities have done. Uh, it sounds like it's had hopefully some payoff the last couple of years. As the chief mentioned, it's really hard on the officers. Um, it's not good for the community. It's something you try to avoid at all costs. Um, are there any kind of common denominators of these instances? 
Go ahead, radio calls, mm -hmm. call for service. I think, and Darren knows the numbers better than me, 64% of the time we're responding to a radio call. 69% of the times that shooting happens within two minutes of us arriving. 81% um, of the time it's a patrol officer that's involved. Mm -hmm. um, and dangerous weapon and a weapon involved 80 something percent of the time. Right, subjects had 85% of the time uh, dangerous weapons exactly or dangerous instruments to involve uh, vehicles guns knives things of that nature as well and one thing that came up at the coffee with the cop presentation i mentioned the officers talked extensively they had more time than half an hour we have here uh, they talked extensively about domestic violence how those are some of the worst calls and and seem to be i don't know if it's most common in officer involved shootings but it was the most common call that they clearly would prefer to avoid obviously you can't avoid it, it has to be done so are, are those situations where things just spiral out of control. I know, I know most of these shootings, based on the statistics I've seen, happen between about three in the afternoon and seven in the morning. So you're, you're talking, it's more common at night. Uh, a lot of the nefarious activity I think you see in your jobs is also more at night. Is there special training uh, that the night officers receive or how does that work? How do you prepare officers for what they may encounter when they go out in these calls? You bet. So a couple of things that we've done as a department is we reinstituted the commander's position within the training bureau and we've also reinstituted the 40-hour training module and that's where officers are starting to learn uh, about uh, crisis intervention, negotiation skills, um, use of force reviews, things of that nature. So those are coming. In addition, um, we're also pushing out a monthly training video as well. So if we do identify trends, like you discussed, the domestic violence being that number one call for service that results in an officer-involved shooting, uh, the, the, uh, the training videos that are put out to the officers on, on a monthly basis can address those type of things. And so as long as we're tracking the shootings, we're doing that, and we're dissecting shootings, we're identifying uh, the trends, and we're training to those trends, as long as we're doing that and capturing the information, uh, then we can get that training to officers uh, where they need it and when they need it. Is there any sort of, well, you've both obviously been out, worked on the street and been in this business a long time as well. Is there any particular, we talked about domestic violence, is there any particular way this goes? Do you just drive up and, and people start shooting or does it escalate? I mean, how does this proceed to the point where the officer has to draw his weapon and fire? The vast majority of our shootings occur very quickly. So when the officer contacts the subjects on scene, I believe it's 79% happen, around 69% happen within two minutes. So the officer has uh, a very short amount of time to engage the subject and try to calm things down. And in domestic violence, that can be very difficult, as you might imagine. So usually you have uh, two sides that, that are inflamed, uh, fighting about whatever, and uh, the officer has to, to get there. And a lot of times they respond alone and they're waiting for backup and so it can be a lot and, and those are the type of things where as long as we are tracking our shootings and as long as we're identifying those trends and we can train to those and so that's where you know we've got uh, de-escalation training that we just uh, started with the department and I believe by August uh, every officer will have gone through that de-escalation training and what that does is it talks about several plans right everybody's got a plan A and as long as plan A works great but if it doesn't and it looks like things are going south you know you should already have a plan B and a plan C and you try to slow things down as much as you can so that you can get the resources there to handle and, and execute plan B and plan C. Well the ride-alongs I've been along as you suggested the officers have been alone and I think that's a pretty standard uh, way that they're going to arrive at a call is, is by themselves, at least initially. Uh, you know, one of the first questions they always ask is, anybody else in the house? Certainly looking around, clearly keeping their head on a pivot to make sure nobody's coming up behind them and so forth, because of course you have no way of knowing in an apartment or a house who else is there, who may have a weapon. Uh, it's almost really an impossible situation uh, for the officers. Is there anything technology related or, or any improvements that have been made to help them in that situation? Because just, just as the person riding along, of course, in that situation, I'm, I'm right there too, and, and I guess in equal peril. Uh, don't tell my wife, or she won't let me run any more ride-alongs. But it's, it's definitely, you're very aware that danger could be coming out of, of really any crevice in, in a house or apartment. What, uh, I mean, is there anything that can be done to make it safer for the officers? You know, there, it's tactics and it's training. Um, you know, every case is different, every environment different, every apartment complex different, every all parties are different. So um, DV is our number one uh, call for officer-involved shootings and, and we're aware of that. And what we preach to the officers in, in training and in our de-escalation training is slow down, be methodical, 
use time and distance. You know, these things happen quickly. If we can create a little time and, time and distance, maybe get a less lethal option there. Um, there's, it's, it all comes back to tactics. And when Darren was talking about our training, it, it, we're talking about slow and methodical. We're talking about planning for success. And how do you do that? Well, you make sure that you have the resources available. You make sure that you know, you're tactically sound in your approach. You're tactically sound in, in how you're contacting the individual or individuals involved. So all that comes back to continuing proficiency training in, in the art of police work. And we have a complicated dynamic job. It, it's a difficult job. So we have to continue to refresh train and make sure our tactics are top notch. Well, it's interesting that you say that because as I, as I walk you know, myself through remembering the episodes in, in which I was an observer, uh, that's exactly how I describe it. Very slow and methodical, like they were working their way through a progression, you know, very step-by-step -step process. Because you're right, you know, and it hadn't really even occurred to me, it's not like police officers come with some sort of radar where they, they know each apartment complex, where each apartment is. Um, you know, it, this is uncharted territory for most of them too, unless they happen to be visiting a house that they've visited relatively recently. Uh, I will say one thing, we talked about the, the 31 in 31 officer involved shootings in 2013. Is that, so is that an officer drawing their weapon and shooting or is that them being shot at as well? Or maybe I, I should have done that first. What, uh, what does that statistic encompass? So it's when an officer shoots at a subject, it's a subject related, so it would not include accidental discharges or firing at an animal, those type of things, so. Uh, if, if someone shoots at the officer or attacks the officer, but the officer does not fire back, that then wouldn't be included in the statistics. So, so there's more, because that was another thing that was discussed at the Coffee with the Cop, the number of violent incidences in which officers are engaged every year, which was a relatively small number of the total number that they're contact, they were, you know, in which they had contact with citizens. And when you think about the population of Phoenix, we're not talking about, when you think about 31 of the, and I don't suppose either of you know how many arrests were made, you know, in 2013 or last year. I mean, it was thousands. For some reason, the number 67,000 was, was uh, sort of sticking too in my high. head. It, it used to be in the 40s. We're probably at about 35,000 arrests. So you think of all so, those arrests, and then you've got Well, you 31. think of all the radio calls, 650,000 radio calls that we get dispatched, give or take, by year. Right. We're up about 2% radio calls. So you think about all those contacts. You think about all those arrests. Yeah. You think about use of forces that we have to use whatever tactics to take somebody into custody. And you think, for this last calendar year, 17 officer-involved shootings. It's amazing I mean, it's, it's not amazing. higher. I remember what I was when thinking at the time. It's break, surprising it's not higher. Right. When you break down those numbers and the millions of contacts that we have in a city of 1.5 million people, I mean, it's just amazing that there isn't more. And we don't, like, the reason we did this study and the reason we do our training is, like we said at the onset of the show, it's a traumatic event when we have to use deadly force. And we only want to do that as a last resort. Well, it was clearly, um, and I can't remember if the number of... Obviously, we talked a little bit about the officer-involved shootings. I can't remember if the violent incidences, I don't know what would be the official term when an officer, say, gets in a fight but doesn't have to shoot his weapon uh, a with the subject. Force. That's, that's a use of yes. force. All right, so use of force. I can't remember what the statistic was about the percentage. It was still relatively small. Again, when you talk about all those calls, 600-something thousand and change calls, I mean, it's, it's a lot less than you might expect. Uh, given that a lot of this, again, is late at night, alcohol or drugs are involved in probably a lot of these calls. Again, you may not have percentages, but, but certainly, again, anybody who goes out at night uh, with an officer, certainly a lot of the contacts then are not people who are necessarily functioning at their highest capacity. I guess we'll just put it that way. Uh, certainly the, the chases I've seen and stuff, again, were people who, who had imbibed something that was impairing their judgment, uh, to say the least. Um, it is just amazing that that you've been able to get it down to 17. But I understand the concern of the community as well. We've had a lot of discussion about this at council meetings, about the times when, when force is used, which brings us around to the, uh, the cameras, the body cameras. Chief, we had talked about this. You were on the show a few months ago. We talked about this a little bit, but maybe more in depth. Um, first, your, your general take on the program. Uh, it's an expensive one. Obviously, the council is now discussing um, how to proceed. Uh, my understanding is it's about $11.4 million over three, or now we're talking about five years, to actually implement the program. And the minority of that money is actually for the cameras themselves and so forth. We have to get people up and running to run the program, and then it's about $5 million a year thereafter. 
which works out to about the equivalent of, of hiring or paying 40 new officers is, is what we've been told budget-wise. So it is a trade-off. Do we hire more officers? Do we do the body cameras? I'm curious your thoughts and uh, some of the benefits you might see from the program. Um, well, a couple things. Uh, first of all, I think we do both. Mm. And you know, we, and we are hiring officers are, apart and, from. And this what, would be 40 officers I, on top of that. Correct. So. And what I was, you know, the mayor and council, uh, you guys have been great in giving and allowing us to hire because we went through a period where we didn't hire for a long time. Five years, or six Five, years? almost six and a half six, years. Yeah. You know, and our our force dwindled from 3,300 sworn to about 2,700 sworn. So we're in the in the process of building that back up. You know, just talk about hiring real quickly. So through your approvals, we can hire 300 people this fiscal year, 15, 16. So we've hired- And we're losing some too. We so are. if you look at the net, it's not quite as good we as are. We've hired the public on that roughly one. 266 people. Now we've lost some, some people through the attrition, through the academy, out into our FTO programs. But we have, this fiscal year, we've put 100 new officers, 105 new officers on the street, roughly. And we have about 90 people in the academy right now. So that's great. So is that we're typical? Hiring. Each academy class is about 90? Because you wouldn't no, even run no. the academy. Academy years. classes are normally uh, 25, 15, because we have other agencies involved. Normal academy class is about 30 total people. We're going to actually do a 50 Phoenix only class that's going to start in June. Which How will many be just, academies do you run a year? Uh, we've, we've probably got four or five classes running right now. So we multiple. Oh, concurrent. Um, so concurrent, yes. So we have four or five classes running right now. We'll probably do 15 to 20 this fiscal year. Um, we just continue to cycle and they all have different cycle dates. So when we talk about hiring, we are making progress in hiring. Are we losing people through attrition? Yes, we are. We lose 86 people in calendar year 2016 and drop. That's a lot of people. So you start looking at the hiring. There is an overall net. It's not as much as we'd like, but we're getting there. Um, when it comes to our hiring capacity, we're almost there. Um, could we hire a few more? Maybe, but we are really, we want the, the best candidates we can get. We want to make sure that we vet those candidates um, all the way through the process. So we want to be, like we talk in our tactics, we want to be very methodical in our hiring. You're not just throwing people out the first Absolutely. day, here's your car and go. They ride right. with someone right for six months. And that a takes training people. Period. Right. That takes people. And we've mm -hmm. talked about our dwindling. Yeah. So we've had to get new FTOs. We, each precinct has to get officers that are FTOs. They have to be trained, um, you know, on how to train people. So there's a, there's a lot to hiring a police officer. But when it comes back to specifically to body cameras, I think they're a winner. I mean, law enforcement agencies from across the country are going to them. Um, we've had a very successful pilot program out in Maryville where we had 150 cameras go out there. We've got a grant for roughly um, 150 more ballpark. Um, we're looking for grand opportunities. So, you know, we're talking slow and methodical. We might be overusing the term, but I kind of like the five-year implementation where we build our camera program as we're rebuilding our police department. So at the end of five years, every officer on the street, not people in an office and so forth, but on the street, That's we have the That's our goal. Camera. So yeah. we're talking our first responders, our SROs, our C um, CAOs, our net guys, you know, all those individuals that are wearing a uniform, we'd like to have them um, with a camera. Now that's, today's numbers, that's 1,742 officers that are wearing a uniform right now. We're going to build upon that. So with the five-year program, and all my numbers are ballpark, we'll have about 2,000 cameras. So we'll have enough for what we have today and the growth that we're doing for hiring. Because in next fiscal year, we have another, I think it's 145 slots to hire. So we're going to continue to hire uh, for, for the next three or four fiscal years, and it would be nice to implement a camera program at that same time to be pushed everything out at the same time. And the other thing about the cameras, if we can, when we hire somebody, we can give them a camera as their initial equipment from a muscle memory, from a training perspective, from a tool of the trade, they get it right at the onset. The training goes much better. The proficiency with the camera goes much better. Yeah, just like changing the computers, which I know you did recently. It's just, if you're anybody who's ever worked in an office and had one computer system and then you switch, obviously that makes it harder. Same thing, I'm sure, it is. with new equipment. Uh, with new equipment, you guys have a lot of equipment. If you ever hang out with an officer, there's a lot of stuff to keep track of, and this is one more thing. Um, there was discussion at the Coffee with the Cop about, I don't I hate to say downsides, but, but take the domestic violence call. Obviously, you go out, you've got your camera on, it's a call, so you, you gotta flip it on, um, and then people's faces are on there and so forth. Part of the money, a good chunk of the money, for the cameras is not for the cameras themselves or even training the officers necessarily to implement them it's and to use them it's for people behind the scenes to be able to redact the video to take out those faces 
uh, you know, take out distinguishing marks in the house and so forth, because obviously you got a camera. You know, a lot of these calls are going to go through people's houses, and obviously, um, if there's no crime been committed, or if you're the victim, you know, perhaps you wouldn't feel great about that. That video's out there if somebody wants to request it. Uh, I believe the video stays for how long? After? It's like 190 days before we purge. Um, I think it was 180 it, days mandated, and then you yeah, added another 10 we, or something like that. Yeah, and we added a little that, cushion yeah. so we'd make sure we did everything right. Um, you know, the privacy issues is big, and everything can be redacted. So before... But somebody you know, has to do that. Somebody has you to do it. You have to have somebody do it. And, and that's, that's what the you issue. key on. Yeah. And then the storage, which you've talked about. You know, the cameras are, are relatively cheap then of themselves. I was very shocked at how cheap it was and, and of the total price it wasn't that great of a cost. You can buy the cameras and put them out there. It's making them work and having them be an effective Well, and then we're responsible for capturing all that public information. And then when, you know, the news media makes a request for whatever, a, redacting that, protecting pre people's privacies, and then get, having a system that gets that information out in a timely man manner, having a system that uh, allows that, uh, and we haven't talked about evidence and, and some of the things that the cameras help us with as far as prosecutions, how you get that over to the city prosecutor and the defenses that are involved in all that and discovery. There's a lot of issues with a camera program. And, and that's why, quite frankly, the five-year plan or our slow methodical plan uh, is better. I read articles all the time about agencies you know, nationwide that you know, they're trying to implement 5,000 cameras you know, in two weeks. It doesn't work. I mean, you have to build these camera programs and, and you learn. And the technology's changing all the time, too. So, you know, that, that's why we went back out for RFP. So when we did a 2011 pilot. We're looking pilot, at companies right now, we right, are. and systems right We're now. We're looking right? and we want the best. Right this minute, I think, actually. actually is you got an expert doing week. it right this minute. Yeah. Um, so we want the best and latest technology because, it's gosh, it changes so quickly. So you're comfortable, it sounds like, with where we're at and moving forward. Um, you know, assuming the privacy rights, tying it back into what we were speaking about earlier, most of the discussion we've had at the city council about the cameras has related to, you know, use of force or officer-involved shooting, some of, some of the tragedies that we've had, uh, you know, here recently in the cities, and really other cities as well. It's, it's not localized to Phoenix. Would the cameras help? Because that's been a big subject of discussion. Would it help more than hiring, you know, the extra officers that we could hire with this money? Obviously, if we spend money on one thing, then we can't spend it on something else. Um, is there any, I know ASU is doing a study, I believe, with the, with the federal, in conjunction with the federal government, so I don't believe it's just Phoenix, to try to see what we might expect in terms of a reduction in, you know, using an all-encompassing term, violence. Are you guys confident that, that that's where we'll get, uh, let's say at the end of five years when this program has been fully implemented? You know, I don't know that you'll get a reduction in violence. What you will get is you'll get uh, better behavior on both parts. Because anytime you turn a video on, it has an impact on the person, the citizen involved, and it has an impact on our officer. Our officer is gonna mind his P's and Q's. Most citizens are gonna mind their P's and Q's. Now, when it comes to, to violence and officer involved shootings, we're still gonna encounter that th same thing. It's just gonna be on video. And the video is a very good tool to tell us what happened. You know, especially if you get a controversial shooting. You know, right, wrong, or indifferent, whatever occurred, we at least, maybe we won't have it all on video because of the movements and obstructions, but you at least have audio. You it know, is a chest camera, right? It's a chest at least camera. The at least the ones at, that we yeah. have now yeah. are chest cameras. I don't know what they're evaluating today out at the academy. So it sees kind of out. Yes, from the, from and, the and some of the out. some of the issues are if it's a chest camera and you know then officers involved in a shooting, well then you can't see the but shooting. You also have the audio. You do. Right? There's audio with all these. Right? So it's a good tool. I mean, is it the catch-all to to determine exactly what occurred? No, but it's better than not having a video. I mean, it really is. And and how do you put a price on that when the community's up in arms about? an officer action and we really don't know what happened because one subject's maybe no longer with us and then we have the officer's story and it just from a transparency from a um, community trust perspective the cameras will help us at least you'll have the audio in any yes. case uh well the officers i mean other cities are doing this already they already have the cameras and you you're studying them correct right. so has there been any best practice in terms of hey just so you know, and remember, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of folks that you're encountering are not always either on their best behavior or in complete control of, of all of their um, behaviors because of different things they may have ingested. I'm curious, you know, do they say, hey, you know, there's a camera right here? I mean, does that, ha has there been any study about the impact of that? Because I do think that might monitor, as you said, you're still gonna have shootings, you're still gonna have people shooting at you. Um, I don't expect someone 
you know, that you catch doing a breaking and entering or something to go, oh wait, he's got a camera, we'll just stop. And I mean, I think they're probably gonna keep doing what they're doing, unfortunately. But is there anything that says that, that the citizen behavior might change? You know, I don't know. What we have uh, in our policies, when practical, we'll say, hey, we're recording this. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, when you're talking to somebody, our officers will tell them that. Um, what we do know is when we did our pilot program out in Maryvale, um, we, knew, we know that citizens' complaints went down. We know that officer arrests went up. The officer, and it's kind of a unique situation, and I asked why, and the officers were more confident that, you know, okay, everything's on video, so my actions are not necessarily justified, but are now... If I stick to my training, exactly. I'm going to be okay because right. my superiors are going to see, the media is going to see, he did things by the book. And we've seen right. with the citizens' mm -hmm. complaints going down, is that because the subject involved knows they're being videoed? It could be. So, I mean, it's real hard to put real tangible things on what the camera does, but overall, uh, the, we've studied it and other people have studied it. It has an impact on public trust. It has an in impact on behavior. Uh, and it also, again, we get back to it, it helps with prosecution. I mean, it really does. The witness statement isn't, isn't what the officer interpreted the witness to say. It's exactly what the witness said because we heard it on video or on audio. So there's a lot to be said about that component of an on-body camera. So it sounds like, I mean, you're completely sold. I assume you talk to chiefs around the country. Um, what, what city has been using the cameras for the longest, if you know, or is there one big city comparable to us that's been using them for a while? And have, they, have, have officers from those jurisdictions said anything to you about how it's gone? No, everybody, I go to major city chiefs conferences about four times a year, and all the major cities are moving towards, in one way, shape, or form, some type of cameras. Um, others have had them for years. Uh, a lot of small agencies have implemented cameras and have very successful um, implementation with them because they're small and it's, it's easy to probably have 16 officers compared to our 1,700 first responders. Um, but the, pos the, the overall um, gist is everybody's very positive about them. Again, it goes back to that trust, that transparency, and knowing what really happened. Well, I appreciate very much your time. I'm afraid we're out of time, but uh, Sergeant Chief, we really appreciate you guys being here today. I thought this was an important, very timely issue as we do our budget discussions and certainly the feedback we're getting at the council meetings. On both sides, I think people are very interested in this particular subject. And that's it uh, for on the issues. If you have any questions or comments or you would like to come to Coffee with a Cop because we'd love to have you, please call me at 602. 262-7445 or visit my website at phoenix.gov slash district 2 and we look forward to seeing you next time on the issues.